or immigration reform or how we're to look at this issue? I think uh, that's a good question to ask. And uh, we've been hearing some promotion among some Christian folks that, you know, we need to um, embrace immigration reform uh, as a Christian act uh, because, you know, we need to accept the the sojourner or the person who's a a foreigner and that kind of thing. That's an act of Christian charity. That's an act of love and acceptance, and and, uh, that's what we hear by some people. Uh, and so is that a misuse of the scriptures or does that apply here? We're going to talk about it today on the program with our guest, Mark Tooley. Mark was on a couple of weeks back, I think, but we had a very short period of time to talk about that. And uh, he joins us, uh, right now. Mark, good morning to you. Hey, Tim. Great to be back with you. Thanks for being on with us for Ray Pritchard is co-hosting uh, with me today. First of all, tell, tell us, tell us about your organization. Well, the Institute on Religion and Democracy has been around for 32 years, and we monitor and often critique and work to reform the, the political and social witness of America's churches. So we were founded primarily to uh, challenge the mainline churches back during the Cold War. Uh, many Jewish leaders and agencies were actively supporting um, unbelievably Marxist revolution overseas under what was called liberation theology. And thankfully, um, they lost that battle, and the Cold War ended relatively well. Uh, but the issue of accountability and political accountability in the churches remains, and it's no longer just an issue in the old liberal mainline. A lot of the same issues are encroaching on the evangelical world, where sometimes church officials are claiming to be politically for church members without a are, clear line of accountability and responsibility. Mark, are the are the are the so-called mainline, some call them old line church denominations, uh, Protestant denominations in America? Uh, such as the United Methodist, the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, the Episcopal Church. I guess there's a Lutheran branch, too, that would be in that category, uh, but I can't name it. Uh, uh, maybe you can. Are those are those denominations uh, which trailblaze the gospel in America across this country, but they, about 20 years ago, started to go into decline in their growth and there, there are reasons for that. Uh, and I want to ask you, are they still in decline? And uh, if so, are the reasons attributable to what you focus on, and that is the, uh, the leadership of those churches becoming so liberal that they're out of touch with uh, their own members in many respects? Go ahead. Well, you're absolutely right, and the decline has been 50 years now. The oh, 50 line, years? Okay. Formerly mainline, now old line. They started losing members in the early and mid-1960s. The last year of growth for the Methodist Church, for example, was 1964, and has lost members every year in the U.S. since then. So, for example, in the early 60s, one out of every six Americans belonged to the seven largest mainline denominations. Today, it's one out of every 16 that's why, they were call, that's, why they were call, that's why they were called mainline, because they exactly. were. Yeah, go ahead. So they, and so um, mm-hmm. today, uh, the decline has even um, accelerated, because most of the so-called mainline have uh, surrendered on the sexuality issues, and in most cases, there has been schism and the creation of new denominations. So you have a new Anglican Church in North America, you have a new Lutheran Church uh, in America, you have a new Presbyterian Church, uh, the only the United Methodists have not collapsed on the sexuality issues, and that's because the membership is global, and the Africans have held them back. But uh, the United Methodist Church continues to lose almost 100,000 members every year in the U.S., although fortunately is gaining 200,000 overseas every year. Now, why would that? Uh, here's what I've never under, quite understood. Uh, I guess I do, but but it's still it doesn't. It's hard to it's hard to fathom or to figure. With these mainline denominations that have been losing members by the millions and losing influence, uh, and as again, I give credit to those denominations for, as I said, trailblazing the gospel across America, and you know we're strong, healthy, vibrant, Bible-believing denominations for centuries, and yet the last thirty years or so, however long you forty, fifty years been steadily in decline 
because uh, would you say that's because they have? Um, I'm just going to assume you're going to say this because I think I know you, Mark. That I mentioned because they don't uh, uh, they, they don't affirm the scriptures on many issues like they used to anymore. So the leadership of the church, even into the seminaries, have gotten away from the authority of the Bible, and and because of that. They they you know lost respect among people who would otherwise be going to church there, so they don't know you know why do you want to go to church somewhere? This is what I've always asked the question: Why do you want to go to church somewhere where they don't believe in anything? <laughs> I mean, you well, got a thousand I, things you can do. You can fish. You can golf. You can sit home and watch TV. Why does anyone? Why is anyone attracted to a church? that's going to go and tell you, well, we really don't know what uh, God thinks about this, or we don't know if the Bible is even true or not. Well, that's exactly right. I cannot think of a single liberal denomination, not just in America, but in the world, that is growing. So global Christianity is thriving and uh, booming, but the liberal Protestant denominations in North America and Europe and Australia and everywhere else are in sharp decline, and you, you would think that would be instructive, but uh, the, the ideologues yeah. who hold power uh, seem to be <clears throat> indifferent to uh, what's happening to their churches. Yeah, you think they'd want to survive. Out. You think they'd want to survive, you know? The, the, if you're losing well, members... Uh, you know, uh, these churches are still relatively wealthy, and they have uh, endowments and the gifts that okay. accumulated over hundreds of years, and so they can keep going for a while, at least financially. Okay. Talking to Mark Tooley. Uh, our guest here uh, on the uh, from the Institute on Religion and Democracy. What about the immigration issue? Uh, we hear voices like the, uh, are they call the, what's the gr- group that's uh, speaking, the Evangelical Immigration Table? Is that what they're called? Yes, yes. Who, who makes up that group? Well, um, a long list of uh, distinguished evangelical leaders have signed on to their initial statement. I suspect that many of them didn't realize it was going to be used politically, as it has been, but the, the National Association of Evangelicals, for example, is very much a part of it, and they represent and include uh, several dozen evangelical um, denominations. So I would encourage your listeners to go to Google Evangelical Immigration Table and look up their um, their list of endorsers, and they may be surprised. Is Max Licato and Richard Land on that? Uh, Dr. Land is. I'm not sure about Max Licato. Okay, I just heard Max's voice in an ad. Where, he's, where they're using Scripture to promote immigration reform. Well, then he would be, because that's part of their um, okay. national um, radio ad campaign. And, of course, Dr. Land's a longtime friend of our ministry here. So I'd like, I, what I'm saying is there are people on this list that I respect, but yet I think uh, I would disagree with them that, uh, you know, the, that, uh, well, you tell me, Mark, what do you think about the way that the Scripture is being applied to try to promote this idea of uh, of immigration reform in America, and and I, the, the the concept basically is that we should uh, accept illegal immigrants into our country because that's the Christian thing to do. That's a loving, kind, merciful thing to act of charity, which is representative of the of the mind of Christ, of what the Bible teaches. And so shouldn't we just, um, you know, welcome people into this country uh, legally or illegally? You want to comment on, on that well, philosophy? That's, that's right. They portray the immigration issue as simply a matter of Christian hospitality and that anyone who happens to cross the border, they will metathize as a, a quote-unquote sojourner, just like in the Old Testament. And uh, they would claim that the, the Hebrew state in the Old Testament uh, automatically uh, welcomed and affirmed um, everyone who came to ancient Israel, and therefore Christians should advocate that the modern U.S. should uh, follow that same example. And I would respond to that, that um, a more careful reading of the Old Testament shows that um, there were different levels and types of immigrants, and uh, there were those who were passing through ancient Israel who were essentially uh, refugees or visitors, uh, and they were certainly upheld with um, no hospitality and and justice, but there's no evidence that the ancient Israel offered all the rights of citizenship and entitlements of that to anyone who happened to cross the border, no matter whether they were there legally or illegally, no matter what their motivation was. So 
to say that the Bible commands uh, political support for the current um, so-called Gang of Eight um, uh, immigration legislation uh, in the Senate is uh, really stepping um, too far, and it really illustrates, I think, where um, the liberal mainline Protestants went wrong, which is um, they began to make political claims that went beyond what the Scriptures say and well beyond what their own church members believed. And I think that that uh, dichotomy and that ultimately lack of accountability contributed to the mainline Protestant uh, um, decline. And I, I hope very much that same trajectory is not followed by evangelicals. Um, well, Mark, I'd like to ask you, I mean, the Bible's a, about this. The Bible's a huge book, and the immigration question is a big question. From from a biblical point of view, how do we how do we begin to take the Bible and and apply it to an issue that is as complex and many sided as immigration reform? Maybe I'm asking you a question about biblical interpretation. How do you how do you take the Bible here and immigration reform there, and take the insights from the Bible and make them useful somehow? Where do we begin? Sure. Well, it's a great question, and we have to do it very carefully and very modestly and accept that uh, the Bible, for political purposes, offers us um, broad principles of mercy and justice and compassion and uh, lawful order, but it doesn't give us direct guidance for all the details of modern politics. It's not a political manual, so we have to be very careful when we claim that uh, the Bible backs our political perspective on every conceivable issue. There are some principles that... Um, are timeless. You know, the Bible has always affirmed a particular definition of, um, and the Church has always affirmed a particular definition of marriage and sexual morality. It's always affirmed the sanctity of all human life from conception to uh, to death. And there are some other essential teachings there, but there are a lot of other, uh, most of politics um, Christians can and do uh, with conviction and principle have disagreements about because they're more issues of prudential um, judgment. You know, it, it does seem like to, to frame it simply as a question of compassion is well-meaning but somewhat short-sighted. Because isn't it true, Mark, that even in the Bible, compassion has to be guided by common sense, has to be guided by, by wisdom and discretion and ability to be, choose between uh, this, 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 and this and to find out what's the best way to express compassion to people in need? Well, that's right. And, we'd, uh, and many of those who are advocating... Um, this uh, so-called biblical approach to immigration legislation are confusing the vocation of the church with the state. The church's um, vocation and calling from God is to offer mercy and compassion and to share the gospel with all people, no matter who they are and what they're doing. Uh, the church's vocation, ordained by God, is to enforce the law and to uphold order and to punish those who are violating the law. So uh, we need to keep those distinctions in mind. We're talking to Mark Tooley uh Mark, what's what, what's your website and what's there? Yeah, please check it out. It's um, theird.org, P-H-E-I-R-D.org. It's the Institute on Religion and Democracy. By the way, I went to the evangelicalimmigrationtable.com, and uh, this is a group, and many, uh, several of these people at least are my personal friends, and <laughs> And we've had them on as guests here on American Family Radio, and, and they're and they're thinkers. They're not, uh, you know, lazy people, but uh, they are supporting this. Uh, and what they would the, what they would tell you, I think these guys would tell you, because I see Matt Staver's name down here. I see, uh, you know, Richard Land. I see Sammy Rodriguez. Among I know those three guys personally, and there are others here. But I think what they would tell us if they could be here to defend themselves is that they, too, agree with securing our national borders. And, uh, you know, uh, in fact, one of their platform talks here is respects the rule of law, uh, protects the unity of the immediate family, ensures fairness to taxpayers. So they're going to tell us, Mark and Ray, that they, too, agree with us that we need na we need border security. So I think it would... But it'd be unfair for us to characterize them as being for open borders, uh, and I'm not suggesting that. But as some people have said, this group is here. But I guess I, I kind of take issue, and I think you do too, Mark. I don't know, Ray. You and I haven't talked about this a whole lot with the idea that um, you know somehow there is a biblical uh, there are, there are biblical principles, but 
Why don't, why don't we ever see this biblical principle, for example, 